Trader Joe's is a real person, and he wrote this memoir about how he founded Trader Joe's, the grocery store. Halfway through this memoir, he makes a reference to this one history book about World War I, and he claims that it's the best management book he's ever read. Now, Trader Joe went to Stanford Business School, so I was like, surely you've read a lot of proper management books in your day. Why is this history book your favorite one? Then I came across another reference to the same book in this biography of Lyndon Johnson. The context was that the US and the Soviet Union were on the brink of nuclear war. This was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And President John F. Kennedy thought of this same book, The Guns of August, about World War I, while he was figuring out how to avoid literal nuclear war. So how has this one history book influenced such different, very successful leaders? Today, I'm going to tell you what I think makes this book great and what my key takeaways were in terms of psychology, leadership, and strategy. And along the way, tell you a bit about World War I. Let's start with why Trader Joe's said that this was the best management book he's ever read. As I mentioned, it's about the lead up to World War I. So it's like a very high stakes situation for all sorts of politicians, military leaders, etc. Like your country is literally on the brink of going to war. And then your country is at war. And with every single strategic decision that you make, you send hundreds of thousands of young men from your country out to the battlefield, potentially to lose their lives, all on the basis of your decisions as a manager. So given the situation, given the stakes, Barbara Tuchman does a really unique job of analyzing the psyches of the key players who are making these decisions. And she even goes a level above that and she analyzes what are the national psyches of the different nations that were at war, particularly Germany, France, Britain. What were the cultural forces that were shaping the ways that these military leaders thought about their decisions? What sorts of events influenced these countries' different philosophies behind how they think that war ought to be conducted, how they think decisions ought to be made, how they think their country ought to be governed? And let me dive into the details for you and give you a brief overview of what exactly the psyches were of these leaders in these countries. So when the book opens, it is 1910. Germany and France have been jealous of each other for a couple of decades. In 1871, the German Empire was incorporated. Prior to that, what we consider Germany was actually a bunch of independent like kingdoms or principalities. And there's this guy, Otto von Bismarck, who is one of the most famous statesmen of all time. He was the chancellor of Prussia, which was this northern German state, and he basically provoked the French into a war against Prussia in order to unite the Germanic territories against a common enemy. This Franco-Prussian war happened in 1870. Otto von Bismarck kind of engineered the public relations so that it looked like France was the aggressor and Prussia had to just defend itself, when in reality, Bismarck did play quite a role in provoking the war. But to the rest of the German territories, they were like, wow, our, our fellow German state of Prussia is fighting this really righteous war against the French people. We feel such sympathy for them. Oh my god, this is amazing. They're winning the war. They're so strong. And this really created like a sense of German nationalism uh, against this common enemy. So in 1871, a year after the Franco-Prussian War, the German Empire was formed. And Prussia essentially united all of these independent Germanic states under its rule. So this is obviously a glorious day for the Germans, but it's a scary day for France, its historical enemy. Doubly so because the Germans had won this war. And so the Germans demanded that they get to annex this contested border territory of Alsace-Lorraine, which is right between France and Germany, and the French conceded because they had just lost this war. And the German Empire was like, woohoo, we're starting off strong with a united empire plus this French territory that we've incorporated into our empire. And the French are humiliated because on top of losing the Franco-Prussian War and giving up their prized piece of territory to the Germans, they also had just watched Napoleon almost conquer all of Europe and then fall. The defeat of Napoleon happened in 1815, which is not too far in the past. And so now when the book opens, or in 1910, it's been, what, 30 years since the German Empire was formed, and what is the state of the national psyches of these two countries? France is feeling weak, they're feeling jealous. They had always taken such pride in the French army, especially under Napoleon, that they were really attached to the symbols of the army's strength. For example, the French army always wore these, like, red pants. It was, like, a big thing, like, the key element of the pride of the French army. And this was like fine back when machine guns were not a thing and it was more like hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
But by the time World War I came about, there had been a lot of advances in military technology, such that wearing bright red pants meant that you would get easily mowed down by machine guns. The French army, for the longest time, stubbornly held on to their red pants because of this pride in their army. And as a result, a lot of French youths died unnecessary deaths. So Tuchman basically describes that the French were feeling insecure, and as a result of their insecurity, they were hanging on to the these symbols of the army's greatness. They really wanted to believe that there was something fundamentally special about the spirit of their army. Now, spirit is an interesting word here because their top army officers and French intellectual class started latching on to the philosophy of this philosopher named Henri Bergson. <laughs> I'm probably not saying it right. This guy was basically like, there is a vital spirit, like a life force that drives everything. It drives evolution. Just like everything in the world is motivated by the by this essential spirit to exert its vitality and exert its strength. The French military school and academics latched onto this philosophy of the vital spirit and translated it in military terms to fighting spirit, to being on the offensive. They essentially were like, in order to win, every soldier needs to have this like vital fighting spirit within them. They need to be so determined to rush at the enemy. And concretely, on the strategic front, this means that you must always be on the offensive. You can never be like defending your territory, reacting to the enemy. No, you have to always seize the initiative. At some point, Tuchman quotes from the French army's field regulations, which say, quote, the French army henceforth knows no law but the offensive. The offensive alone leads to positive results. And Tuchman states that from a sort of psychological perspective, latching on to the idea of the offensive helped the French people psychologically cope with these insecurities and feelings of inferiority to the Germans by being like, well, sure, you know, sure the Germans have our territory, sure the Germans are doing really well economically, but do they have this fighting spirit? We as the French are the most spirited. We're always going to be seizing the offensive. So, that was the French mentality, as Barbara Tuchman describes it. I do want to caveat on this by saying that Tuchman takes some liberties in doing some psychoanalysis here uh, that isn't entirely scientific, but overwhelmingly, I think there's a reason that history books today tend to be quite boring because no one wants to hear- okay, I won't say no one, but very few people want to just hear a dry list of facts about like, oh yeah, this thing happened, and then that thing happened, and then that happened, and then there was a war. But hearing Barbara Tuchman's hot takes and psychoanalyses of these national psyches, like sure, maybe she's overreaching, maybe she's wrong, but it's interesting. It makes you think. Again, why did Trader Joe say that this history book was the best management book he's ever read? It's because when you're in a management position, you need to think critically. You can't just list facts and accept them at face value and congratulate yourself on your knowledge. You need to dig deeper. Like, okay, yes, objectively we do have documents that show that French military officials were very into the idea of the offensive. And while another historian might just present it as like, yes, this was the French military philosophy, Barbara Tuchman goes a step further and she's like, well, why? Why did they believe this? And she's like, well, I think it was born of their insecurities. That's interesting. All right, now onto the German national psyche. So the Germans, too, have this combination of arrogance and insecurity. Now, they're feeling really confident in some respect because their economy is booming. They've built a ton of new railways. They're industrializing rapidly. German culture was also flourishing. Richard Wagner, Brahms, Schumann, all these musicians lived during this period of the German Empire. Nietzsche lived during this period. Thomas Mann lived during this period. Things were going really great for the German Empire. However, they were also insecure. The Kaiser, in particular, was insecure. Uh, by the way, the Kaiser is essentially a hereditary king from the royal family, and then the Chancellor is someone who's selected to help run the government. Okay, so Kaiser Wilhelm II, he took over the throne in 1888. He's depicted as this man who's just very jealous, insecure, kind of small-minded. One passage that I found, frankly, funny from The Guns of August is, um, the Kaiser essentially prided himself on traveling to many different great cities around the world and giving these grand speeches, and he always longed to be invited to Paris. Paris, quote, the center of all that was beautiful, all that was desirable, all that Berlin was not. But the Kaiser died at 82 without seeing this fashionable French capital. Tuchman also describes how 
Uh, remember the territory of Alsace Lorraine that Germany had annexed from France? Tuchman describes that the Germans were mad and confused about why it was that they had annexed Alsace Lorraine several decades ago, and the inhabitants were still unhappy to be a part of Germany. They still really held on to their French cultural identity. And they were like, why? Why do they want to be French? Why, why don't they want to be German? Do they think German culture is inferior? She also brings up a bunch of examples of Wilhelm saying things like, the other monarchs of Europe don't respect me, they don't listen to what I have to say, but once they see the power of my great army or navy, they will listen. Essentially what I'm describing is this complex around feeling like even though Germany had made such strides in their economy, in literature and music, still for some reason they were perceived as culturally backwards by other countries. And even though France was lagging behind in military progress and economic development, still they were perceived to be the fashion capital of the world, still tourists flocked to Paris instead of Berlin, and the Kaiser was like, why? Why is it so hard for me to earn the love of the rest of the world when I've made my country so great by every objective measure? The Germans also have another core insecurity, which is that they were bordered on one side by France and on the other side by Russia. And France and Russia were allies, so essentially if war ever broke out in Europe, they would very likely be facing both France and Russia on both sides of their territory. So for decades actually, the Germans had been working on a plan called the Schleifen Plan that was thinking about, in the case of this European war, how do we mitigate the existential threat of enemies on both sides surrounding us. Top military minds for decades had been planning this extremely meticulous plan. The premise was that Russia is extremely big and not very developed in terms of their transportation infrastructure. So from the time that war was declared, it would take Russia quite a few days to actually mobilize their soldiers and their resources over to the German border, uh, just because of their sheer size and lack of infrastructure. So during the period that Russia is trying to mobilize their troops over to Germany, Germany needs to quickly smash France. So as soon as war is declared, Germany must instantly mobilize, concentrate all their forces on the Western Front, completely defeat France as quickly as possible so that as soon as Russia is ready to meet them on the eastern border, they can then move their troops over to the east to fight Russia. Culturally, Germany is very planned and logical with these things. The way that Barbara Tuchman describes the Schleifen plan and all of their military strategizing, it's just extremely, extremely meticulous. I mentioned previously, the French school of thought was like, it's all about the fighting spirit. The German school of thought was virtually the opposite. They were like, it's all about strategy. Remember, Germany is the country that produced Karl von Clausewitz, the great military strategist who wrote On War, which is basically the Western equivalent of the art of war, and considered one of the greatest works of military strategy and philosophy ever written. This book was published in Germany in 1832. And the overwhelming German military philosophy was that there is an objectively correct strategic best move in any military situation. And the thing to do is to analyze the situation logically and apply the best strategic principles to arrive at what the logical best move is. Essentially, they believed that in war, whoever has the best strategy wins. So in the military academies, they trained every single student in strategy. Actually, in conducting the war, they gave each individual general a lot of leeway to make their own decisions because their whole thing was each of our generals has gone through the military academy. They have basically downloaded these strategic algorithms into their brain such that in any given situation, they'll be able to arrive at the objectively correct next move to make. And so we should let the lower level generals have as much decision-making autonomy as possible because they have the best data, they have the best understanding of what's going on in the field, so they should be able to make the best decision. So that's on the, the two military philosophies. To go back to the Kaiser, this guy is really insecure. He wants to prove German superiority. And Tuchman also says that Nietzsche, the famous German philosopher, spread this philosophy of, to grossly oversimplify things, that the strong have the right and almost the obligation to impose their will onto the weak. And the Germans believed that they were strong. So in a sense, they were almost itching for an excuse to go to war in order to prove their superiority over the rest of Europe. And then the excuse for war arrived. A Serbian nationalist shoots the Duke of Austria-Hungary, 
Austria declares war on Serbia. Russia wants to help out the Serbians because they are a fellow Slavic country. Germany pledges help to Austria in fighting Serbia and Russia. And then France is allied with Russia. So now Germany and France find themselves on opposite sides of the war and Britain is considering entering the war. The Ottomans are also considering entering the war. Things escalate very rapidly. The Germans were under a lot of pressure at this point to declare war and mobilize their soldiers as soon as possible because, again, in order to avoid encirclement on both sides, time was of the essence. The Germans needed to crush the French before the Russians could get a chance to move their troops over to their border. They were basically like, every single extra day that we can spend moving our troops and fighting France could be a matter of life and death. So the Kaiser issues the mobilization order to start getting the soldiers to say goodbye to their families, put on their uniforms, head to the train stations, round up the cavalry and the food supplies, and load them onto the trains. And this day of mobilization is so meticulously planned that Motka, who's the chief commander of the army, is proudly just lying on a couch on the day of mobilization because everything has been planned. Quote, according to a schedule precise, down to the number of train axles that would pass over a given bridge within a given time. Around this time, the other world leaders start to get cold feet. They're like, wait, are we actually going to war here, guys? This is kind of a big deal. Can we talk? And the Kaiser is also getting cold feet. The Kaiser is like, yeah, I don't know if I really want to fight France and Russia and all these people. Maybe we should talk about peace. But the German military leaders tell the Kaiser, no, we cannot stop the mobilization order. We've already started it. This is the day that we've been planning for, for decades. Mobilization day against France. Things are going exactly according to schedule. The Schleifen plan has dictated exactly which territories they need to take over on which days. And if one part of it fails, what the contingency plan is going to be. But there is no contingency plan for the Kaiser randomly halting mobilization because the Kaiser is getting cold feet about going to war. No, that's going to lead to utter chaos. They don't know how to deal with that. And so the military leaders convince the Kaiser that mobilization cannot be halted. So the Kaiser essentially is like, yeah, sorry guys, like, I don't really want to go to war either, but my soldiers have started mobilizing. It's too late to stop them now. Um, I'll, I'll see you on the battlefield. One key takeaway there is if you're too reliant on planning and you're not willing to be flexible about your plans, it can lead to complete disaster. The war could have potentially been avoided altogether if the Germans had been more willing to pause their mobilization instead of being so rigid about adhering to their plans exactly. This part, by the way, I think is what John F. Kennedy thought about during the face-off with the Soviet Union. He was like, I don't want to back the Soviet Union into a position where, like the Germans, they feel that their time is running out, they're backed into a corner, they need to act, or internally, politically, maybe the rest of the government doesn't actually want to commit to war. Maybe, like, the internal military leaders are pressuring them. Uh, so Kennedy was basically like, I'm going to give the Soviets every possible benefit of the doubt. I'm going to as much as possible, reduce the pressure on them so that they don't feel like they're cornered into a situation where they have to enter nuclear war or face this existential threat to their country. Okay, here's another interesting psychological anecdote. So for various strategic reasons, the Germans decided that they were going to send their troops through Belgium in order to attack France. And they didn't plan to fight Belgium. They assumed that Belgium would just let them march through their territory. They, they told the Belgians, like, hey, we don't want to fight you. We just want to march through your territory. Thanks, guys. But the Belgians were really mad. They were like, no, you can't just march through our territory. That's a violation of our neutrality and our rights as a nation. And the Germans were operating under the assumption that there was no way the Belgians would fight them because it just made no rational sense. Belgium is like a tiny country. It's weak. There's no way that they could take on the German army. So the Germans were like, well, like, why would the Belgians unnecessarily sacrifice their men when they could just let us peacefully pass through? But the Belgians put up a surprising amount of resistance. And so the Germans actually had this interesting psychological response, at least according to Barbara Tuchman, where they kept thinking, okay, well, if I just make it more obvious to the Belgians that it makes no logical sense for them to resist us, then they'll just stop and we'll get to pass through their territory. So they kept brutalizing the Belgians. They were like, okay, if any civilian from any village dares to shoot at a German soldier, we're going to like massacre the entire village or burn the whole village down. You know, all these absolute atrocities. And Tuchman believes that this just came from a genuine place of 
frustration and confusion. Like they were so frustrated that they're on this like very strict timetable. They need to get to France. The Belgians are just senselessly slowing them down and killing their soldiers. And at least in Tuchman's telling of it, the Germans just needed to like knock some sense into these Belgians. Tuchman says, quote, the Germans left uh, this city of Belgium scorched, crumbled, hollowed out, charred, and sodden. Profoundly moved by this picture of desolation wrought by his German troops, German General von Hausen departed from the ruins of the town, secure in the conviction that the responsibility for its destruction lay with the Belgian government, which had approved this perfidious street fighting contrary to international law. In other words, the, this German general believed that the Belgian government had gravely sinned by allowing their citizens to harass the German army that was passing peacefully through its territory, and therefore it was correct for the Germans to burn down this town, but unfortunately this really backfired because there were just all these horrible news reports that came out of Belgium of Germans just like slaughtering their citizens. One of the worst pieces of PR that came out of this was there's this like famous library at Louvain that represents centuries of like culture and knowledge uh, and then the Germans burned the library down. An official statement of the German Foreign Office affirmed that, quote, the entire responsibility for these events rests with the Belgium government, end quote. The whole world was terrified. They were like, my god, these barbarians. <laughs> and actually, the French had been trying to convince the British to come into the war and help them fight Germany for quite a while. And the British were pretty on the fence because they were like, this is kind of none of my business. But after they saw the atrocities that Germany had committed in Belgium, this really pushed the British over the edge. They were like, oh wow, the Germans need to be stopped if this is the kind of philosophy that they have. Again, here we see another weakness in the German way of thinking, which is assuming too much that other people will always behave in a rational way, not accounting for the Belgians' sense of national pride, not accounting for the visceral sense of international horror that they would provoke by burning down all these Belgian villages and libraries. So those were the highlights of Tuchman's analysis of the national psyches of the countries. Now let's talk about the psychology of the military leaders themselves. I think the most interesting military leader in this book was General Joffrey, who was the chief commander of the French army. So the, the Germans eventually did make it through Belgium and into France, and once they got to France, it was just victory after victory after victory. Within six weeks, the Germans were a day away from taking Paris. Later, French officials would call these six weeks the most tragic period in all of French history, and Joffrey was the man who was in charge of the entire French military during this period of defeat after defeat after defeat. Joffrey's response, though, to all this was never to take personal responsibility. Instead, he blamed every single military defeat on someone else. The soldiers were not attacking with enough fighting spirit. The generals on the ground were issuing the wrong orders. While all these defeats were happening, while French families were getting subject to the dominion of German soldiers, Joffrey was sleeping soundly at night and eating three gourmet meals a day. Quote, Joffrey ate in silence with a gourmet's entire devotion to the food. He complained continuously of being kept in the dark by his staff. He used to rub his forehead, murmuring, poor Joffrey. He was angered by anyone who tried to change his mind. He was almost a despot, jealous of his authority, resentful of the least encroachment upon it. You know, terrible leader in all these senses. But at the moment of disaster, it was actually Joffrey's supreme delusional confidence in himself and refusal to take responsibility for any military disaster that actually saved him and saved France, because he alone, of all the commanders on the field, was able to still maintain perfect calm in this hour of crisis and not contemplate giving up, not contemplate suicide, as during this time, everyone else was rapidly losing morale. Within a week, the British commanders were thinking of giving up. Even the German commanders, who were on a winning streak, were suffering from nerves, because this is a very high-pressure situation. Quote, the hero of Liege, the German commander who, like, won this great battle, quote, seems to have lost his nerve a little. Grave doubts afflicted him, and at this moment, his colleague had to stiffen his nerves. And, quote, Joffrey, alone, standing amid the tumbled debacle of all French hopes, with responsibility for the catastrophe resting upon him, every one of his armies in retreat were fighting desperately to hold a defensive line, remained magically unperturbed. By immediately casting the blame on the executors, he was able to retain perfect and unblemished confidence in himself and in France, 
and in so doing, provide the essential and unique requirement in the calamitous days ahead. Because, as we all know, Germany did not win the war in 1914. The war lasted for four more years, and Germany never took over Paris because France made a miraculous comeback. Now, how did this comeback happen? It was in part thanks to Joffrey's imperturbable leadership, rallying the French to make one last stand, and it was also in part due to German errors. So a big theme among the leaders in the book is that they keep believing what they want to believe, contrary to what the evidence would suggest, and essentially letting their emotions get in the way. And this happens to the Germans. Most obviously, it happens to General von Kluck, who just became arrogant. There was one part of the German line that was not as heavily manned, and that section of the line was vulnerable to attack from the French. And this guy, Von Kluck, who's commanding a segment of the army, he was told, hey, this part of the line is weak. Please come reinforce this line. Just like, take your army and guard this other general's troops because he needs support here. He might get attacked and beaten. And Von Kluck was like, no, I don't want to have my troops be just protecting someone else's troops. I don't want to be someone else's second in command. I want my troops to be the ones to march into Paris. And so he made the fatal mistake of making his troops continue marching instead of falling back to defend the weak part of the line. Uh, part of that was also him believing what he wanted to believe. He just wanted so badly to believe that the French were utterly beaten. There was no way they could make a comeback at this stage. When actually, no, you can't allow yourself to believe that. Whether in business or in war, you cannot succumb to this kind of wishful thinking that your enemy or your competitor is weaker than they really are. Von Kluck made this fatal mistake of willfully deluding himself into underestimating the strength of the French troops and willfully deciding that he wanted to take a risk, essentially, risk the entire German victory in order for him personally to command the troops that would play a core part of entering Paris and winning the decisive victory. So that's a simplified psychological view into the German mistakes. There were a variety of reasons behind the German failure. For example, Belgium's resistance made it so that they didn't have as many troops concentrated in France as the Schleifen plan dictated. They had to divert some troops over to the Eastern Front to try to keep out the Russians, and they didn't move those troops back to France when they probably should have. Moltke, who was the commander-in-chief, turned out to be unable to adapt to changing circumstances when things went differently from what the Schleifen plan dictated. But on the French side, Joffrey and this other brilliant French general correctly sensed that there was some weakness in the German line, and according to their doctrine of the offensive, they organized a huge offensive against the part of the German line that they had correctly perceived to be weak. And this was a huge endeavor. Again, the Germans were not completely delusional in believing that the French could not make a comeback, because at this point, their French troops were exhausted and sort of spread all around. And so they had to be very resourceful in organizing and transporting their troops to come make this last stand against the Germans before they invaded Paris. There's like this whole scene where the temporary governor of Paris summons all of the taxi drivers across all of Paris to help transport soldiers to the front. All these cabs are like driving across the city. They dump out their passengers. They're like, I'm sorry, I can't give you a ride. I need to do my patriotic duty. They meet at this depot. All the soldiers pile into the taxis and the taxis drive off to the battlefront. And the French do defeat the Germans. The Germans never reach Paris. Instead, the French pushed the Germans back, but neither side was able to win a decisive victory. Neither side's philosophy, strategy, and execution added up to be clearly superior to the others. So there was just this four-year stalemate where 40 million people died for no good result. It's a very sad conclusion when you think about it, and Tuchman definitely makes you feel the sadness and the impact of it. I want to conclude by quickly talking about Tuchman's writing style and how she successfully gets you emotionally invested in this whole saga. I want to read you a redacted version of the opening paragraph of The Guns of August, which Barbara Tuchman spent months editing. So gorgeous was the spectacle on the May morning of 1910, when nine kings rode in the funeral of Edward VII of England, that the crowd, waiting in hushed and black-clad awe, could not keep back gasps of admiration. Three by three, the sovereigns rode through the palace gates, with plumed helmets, gold braid, crimson sashes, and jeweled orders flashing in the sun. Together, they represented 70 nations in the greatest assembly of royalty and rank ever gathered in one place, and of its kind, the last. The muffled tongue of Big Ben tolled nine by the clock as the cortege left the palace, 
but on history's clock, it was sunset, and the sun of the old world was setting in a dying blaze of splendor never to be seen again. I think that line, on history's clock it was sunset, the sun of the old world was setting in a dying blaze, is an insane opening, and it immediately throws you into a sense of impending tragedy, a sense that some era is about to end. So what exactly is this ending that Tuchman is describing? To quote from her afterward, quote, when every autumn people said the war could not last through the winter, and when every spring there was still no end in sight, only the hope that out of it some good would accrue to mankind kept men and nations fighting. When at last the war was over, it had one dominant result transcending all others, disillusion. All the great words were cancelled out for that generation. The great words and beliefs of the time before 1914 could never be restored. Essentially, I think what Tuchman is saying is that before 1914, before the war broke out, people had the sense of confidence and security in the way that the world was. You know, people live in these empires that are ruled by these monarchs. People largely accepted their place in society and just tried to be the best person that they could be within these constraints. But after World War I, there was the sense of, my god, I can do my duty and it can all be for nothing. It could just end in four years of pointless war. We thought that we, we all lived under empires, but actually over the course of World War I and the immediate aftermath, the Russian Empire got overthrown by communists, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire collapsed, the Ottoman Empire also collapsed, the British Empire greatly declined in its power. There was a sense of like, anything is possible now. The lives of people across Europe, across the world, changed as a result of the decisions that these key leaders made on the road to war and during the war. It gives the reader a sense of emotional investment in these events that happened so many years ago. Again, if what you're looking for is a very facts-based view of academic scholarship, this might not be the book for you, but as someone who is not an academic or a professional historian, I think her analysis helps readers build an intuition for what sorts of strategies work under what kinds of circumstances. Thanks for listening and see you next time.